Um, okay, let's get started. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first of four public art talks uh, here at the Leslie MFA uh, June 2021 residency. I'm the director of the program, Ben Sloat. Uh, we will start our program with a land acknowledgement. Leslie University here in Cambridge resides on the ancestral and unceded lands of the Massachusetts peoples, whose name was appropriated by this commonwealth. We pay respect to the Massachusetts peoples and their neighbors, the Wampanoag and Yitmung peoples, who have stewarded this land for generations. And we offer our appreciation to the lands and waters for sustaining us. Our general thematic for this residency is repatterning, which considers the way gestures, personal behaviors, cultural aesthetics, and larger social systems are being reevaluated and restructured as we look towards a post COVID world. Our programs began yesterday with a faculty talk by Laurel Sparks titled Dream Machines, and we'll continue tomorrow with a talk by the installation artist Lee Ming Wei, Wednesday with curator and mixed media painter Michelle Grabner, and Thursday with the curator Denise Marconich. I hope those watching the YouTube live stream on the front page of our website can join us for those programs. I'm excited to introduce today's speaker, our June 2021 visiting faculty, Evan Garza, who is a DC-based curator, writer, and a 2021-2022 Fulbright U.S. scholar at the Irish Museum of Modern Art in Dublin. Uh, he and Ryan N. Dennis are the co-curators and artistic directors of the 2021 Texas Biennial, which opened September 1st of this year. Uh, Garza has held curatorial positions at Rice University in Houston, the Blanton Museum of Art in Austin, and SMFA at Tufts here in Boston. He co-founded the Fire Island Artist Residency in New York, uh, the first residency program in the world exclusively for LGBTQ plus artists. Uh, please unmute and join me in welcoming Evan Garza. Hi, um, yay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's so wonderful to be here. Uh, can everybody see me and hear me? Great. Um, yeah, I'm just really pleased to be here. Uh, it's been a fabulous experience uh, thus far uh, throughout the um, throughout the week, and uh, I'm just so appreciative to um, the Leslie MFA program. I want to thank Ben Sloat, uh, Rebecca Joy, um, and uh, Laurel Sparks, and all of the faculty. Uh, it's been a, a fabulous experience, and I'm uh, really honored and pleased to uh, to be able to share. Uh, to share this talk with you, um, I thought, uh, you know, I've, I've given uh, many different kinds of talks and uh, I figured since the, uh, the theme of this residency program is repatterning, uh, that I would focus specifically on uh, the, bio, the 2021 Texas Biennial, um, which I am organizing uh, with my co-curator Ryan Dennis uh, for Big Medium, which is in Austin, nonprofit organization serving artists across Texas. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully, you know, I'm, I'm uh, gonna demystify the curatorial process of putting a, a biennial together. Um, and uh, I'll do that essentially through kind of retelling of uh, an unpacking really of, of 2020. Um, but um, let me go ahead and, uh, and share and we can get started. Uh, so my talk today is titled "Everything Worthwhile Is Done with Other People," um, which is uh, this is a direct quote from uh, prison abolitionist and organizer um, Maria Mekaba. Um, I wanted to start here um, because within days of uh, our invitation to or organize the next iteration of the Texas Biennial. Um, uh, Tatiana Jefferson uh, was shot and killed by Fort Worth police in, uh, while in her own home as she was babysitting her eight-year-old nephew. Uh, weeks later, um, the uh, largest recipient uh, of, of refugees in the country, which is the state of Texas, uh, became the first state to refuse them when uh, the governor declined to consent under a new White House executive order. Um, kids were in cages families separated, anti-trans bathroom bills were being argued on the state house floor in Texas. Um, it was a, an incredibly tumultuous moment uh, uh, at the time. And uh, we, our invitation actually came just days uh, really after the El Paso shooting. Um, and so there was a, uh, there was a great deal of, of um, racially motivated tumult uh, that we were 
very keenly aware of. Uh, we were also keenly aware that for uh, black, brown, queer, and trans artists, uh, the centering of uh, violence and trauma narratives has long really been a sort of curatorial default, uh, I think, for museums and institutions. Uh, and while ethno-nationalism and the dehumanization of black, brown, and trans bodies in Texas may very well have been the social and political point of origin uh, for uh, you know, when we received the invitation to organize the biennial, uh, Ryan and I were insistent really that through the work of contemporary artists that the project look forward, outward in all directions uh, with a critical lens pointed backwards as a means of understanding the present moment and constructing possible futures. Uh, the previous iterations of the Texas Biennial have been varied uh, in terms of site and uh, in terms of both site and curatorial structure. Um, past past uh, iterations have largely um, been uh, condensed into a single venue, uh, like a warehouse in Austin, for example, in 2017, uh, or displayed among multiple exhibition partners, such as the 2013 Biennial here. Uh, for whom uh, Virginia Rutledge was curator at large. Uh, and as you can see, the, this group uh, survey exhibition, uh, which was hosted by Blue Star Contemporary in, in San Antonio, uh, had, several, uh, had several curators. Um, so there was uh, uh, each of the past, each of these past uh, iterations of the Texas Biennial, however, had focused exclusively on artists living and working in Texas. Um, the reach and influence uh, of what takes place in Texas extends to every corner of the globe, uh, which meant that uh, you know, for the criteria for biennial participating artists really had to be expansive. So in addition to artists living and working in Texas, uh, we broadened the scope to include what we called Texpats, uh, which was a term we coined for Texans and artists with deep connections to Texas living and working um, in uh, any part of the world. Uh, so current and past core fellows, um, educators, retirees, um, nomads, immigration activists, um, artists from land neighboring Texas, these were all folks who uh, were included in the pool. Um, some of our favorite Texas born artists um, have lived in places like New York and California, um, the Northeast uh, or, or elsewhere uh, for decades and uh, countless Texas artists are active internationally. Um, so if, if an immigrant city like Houston, uh, which is the most ethnically diverse metropolitan area in America, can give birth to the multicultural gift that is Viet Cajun crawfish, uh, this is a conversation that we that really had to be international in scope. We really had to expand it. Um, and if we were to engage fully in a conversation about its cultural, social, and environmental impact, uh, Texas really had to be framed in a global lens. And so, uh, you know, so must its artists. Um, we were also interested in artists, uh, international artists, uh, for whom Texas and its history uh, were subject matter. Um, this is my amazing uh, co-curator, my sister, uh, Ryan Dennis. This is us. Uh, working in Houston pre-pandemic um, with um, little uh, Ahmet and Toe. Uh, Ryan and I were both living in Houston uh, when our work on the biennial began. Uh, and um, uh, the photo on the left is us at Ryan's place in Third Ward and the photo on the right is uh, at Gay Gardens, which was our little slice of queer paradise in Houston's museum district. And we began our process by looking at projects and curatorial models that had been really eye-opening uh, or really influential for each of us. Uh, so it wasn't really a surprise uh, that we would probably, that we would start with uh, Okui and Wazor. Um, so uh, how can artists, thinkers, writers, composers, choreographers, singers, and musicians through images, objects, words, movements, actions, lyrics, and sounds bring together publics in acts of looking, listening, responding, engaging, and speaking in order to make sense of the current upheaval what material, symbolic or aesthetic, political or social acts will be produced in this dialectical field of references to give shape to an exhibition which refuses confinement within the boundaries of conventional display models? These were the central questions posed um, by uh, the late curator Okui and Wazor for the 56th Venice Biennale, All the World's Futures. 
Um, my past role uh, previously was as director of public art at Rice University, and Ryan had been public art curator at Project Row Houses for several years. So we knew we were interested in a very, very real engagement with uh, the public and with publics, um, but which publics and why. Uh, we were motivated by a very similar interest in Oakley's central questions for the Venice Biennale, um, as well as um, our own interest in centering the work of black, brown, queer, trans, and historically marginalized artists, which uh, has really been very central to uh, each of our curatorial practices. Um, in January and February 2020, we did, uh, again, pre-pandemic, we did uh, initial studio visits and gallery visits um, with uh, artists uh, while we were living in Houston. Uh, the first was with sculptor Jamal Cyrus, uh, whose first uh, career survey recently opened at the Blaffer uh, Art Museum at the University of Houston. Um, uh, by early March 2020, uh, my husband and I were living in DC and Ryan uh, was leaving Houston to take on the role of chief curator at the Mississippi uh, Museum of Art in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, we, I should probably say here that um, I think we had taken for granted uh, the amount of time that we would have together on the ground in artist studios, in person, in situ, maskless, pre-COVID. Uh, and, and we really, uh, we were taking our time. We really thought that we had a, you know, 18 months to, um, to get inside of studios and uh, to meet folks, and um, and we were we were wrong about that. So enter COVID. Um, within days of landing in our new homes, uh, by the way, this is a this is a um, an airflow study from the National Institute of the Standards and Technology. Um, within days of landing in our new homes, uh, we were each you know relegated to a self-induced quarantine. Uh, and like all exhibition teams last year, we had no choice but to either cancel or postpone the biennial. And there was a good argument to be made for having more time with artists uh, to respond and to plan a really ambitious project. Um, but what would a biennial look like in the midst of a global pandemic and how would we build it? In-person studio visits were now out and uh, plans to exhibit the project in one venue, you know, really made no sense, uh, no longer made sense for public health. So we took a long break uh, to deal with our own health and safety and to sort of imagine what the future of the project looked like, which in that, you know, last, uh, last March, April, May looked, looked pretty dim. We, we honestly didn't know if we were gonna have a project uh, to, um, to consider. <clears throat> Um, and then uh, George Floyd was murdered. Um, it was a pretty wild experience to be here in our nation's capital in DC in the midst of the Black Lives Matter protests. Um, I felt like I had been living through history, uh, living in Texas uh, with all of the um, events that were taking place there. And now we were living this history uh, in DC uh, out. It was, it was there in front of us uh, to find. And we didn't, when I say we, I mean, um, my husband and I didn't quite know what to make of it, given that um, we were so motivated to, or I was so motivated to, to be out on the ground uh, protesting. My husband is a journalist, so he's, uh, he simply can't attend protests of any kind. Um, but I was uh, incredibly motivated to to get out to protest, but of course, in the middle of a pandemic, um, had no idea whether it was wise to do that. Uh, and for the first week of these protests, I was at home. Um, it's it's really difficult to put into words what uh, last summer in DC was like. Um, and so, I, as a means of trying to capture that, I've, I've actually um, I'm going to read a small excerpt uh, from uh, an essay that I wrote last June for um, a queer anthology of healing, uh, which was published by um, uh, Pilot Press in London. Everything is on fire. Each night across the country, cops are arresting hundreds of peaceful American citizens instead of three more of their own. We're exhausted from staying up all night filming police encounters from our apartment window, 
making sure cops weren't roughing up black folks and protesters on the street after curfew. I haven't been to a protest because I'm afraid of getting COVID or arrested or shot. Every day that I don't pull up, my isolation and guilt triple in size. I feel as empty as a black square on Instagram. Helicopters are circling low above our building in DC when we learn my husband's mother is in the ER. The hospital guidelines mean no one from the family can come see her even though she is COVID negative. Stunned, my husband asks if I can run out and grab a bottle of wine before curfew. So I throw on a mask and head downstairs. The liquor store at the end of the block is already boarded up. It's then that I see a small crowd of people gathered at the DuPont Circle Fountain. Impassioned chants of Black Lives Matter echoing loudly down the block immediately knock tears out of my face. I sprint towards the sound and feel a swift rush of relief wash over me, like the long anticipated tonic of the first summer wave slamming against my body. After three months of physical isolation, the queer fates have brought me to my people. I resist the urge to wipe my face with my hands and make my way into the crowd. My voice quivers with every sound leaving my body. I lose control of my voice as I shout and suddenly I'm sobbing. My crying is muffled by the crowd's chants and I'm comforted by their cover. I look around hoping to see someone I know, <clears throat> uh, but we just moved to DC about 48 hours before lockdown. Uh, masked passersby and neighbors from surrounding blocks began to flood the circle. Within minutes, a small crowd of angry, mourning queer people has become a diverse mass of protesters. There are no police in sight. It's just us. There's a sense that each of us in this moment are the truest forms of ourselves, present, out, united in anger, united in peace. I have no friends here, and every single one of these people is family. When I get home, my husband is staring out the window. A Black Hawk helicopter circles no more than three or four stories above our building, filled with armed military personnel ready to deploy. Our pockets were, and then we see the news. Federal police have just fired tear gas and rubber bullets at a crowd of peaceful protesters standing in Lafayette Park, eight city blocks southeast of us, so the president could walk across the street to stage a photo op with a Bible in front of a church. Uh, last summer, as the world fell apart and then collectively attempted to rebuild itself, I thought a lot about the words of organizer, author, and prison abolitionist Mariame Kaba. Her work is deeply rooted in collective action. Kaba's father was an anti-colonialist organizer in the revolution that freed Guinea from French control in 1958, and the pan-African spirit of his work profoundly informed her understanding of the importance of collectivity. He always told me, your responsibility is not just to yourself. You are connected to everyone. Everything worthwhile is done with other people. I repeated this statement to myself daily in quarantine. Everything worthwhile is done with other people. In between protests, I also frequently revisited the last published writing by Felix Gonzalez Torres, a deeply political and personal essay for his friend, the artist Ronnie Horn, and her 1996 Wexner Center exhibition catalog, Earth's Grow Thick. Felix was dying of AIDS and wouldn't live long enough to see the show for which Horn's book was published. Yet despite his disease, government inaction, the death of everyone around him, economic collapse, a growing culture war, and his own impending death, Gonzalez Torres built space within all this chaos to stop and marvel at the beauty and queer potentiality of Horn's work. When Felix's partner Ross Laycock was dying of AIDS in 1990, the two of them happened upon Horn's gold field, a sheet of pure gold thinner than a piece of paper lying directly on the gallery floor at LA MoCA. To Felix, the sculpture was a new landscape, a possible horizon, a place of rest and absolute beauty. Gonzalez Torres whose untitled piles of candy require installation by a team and the participation or consumption of several viewers, um, uh, Felix was uniquely aware of the significance of collectivity and he recognized it at work in Horn's practice. As Bell Hooks describes in the same catalog, um, 
uh, Horn's work, quote, calls attention to the primacy of solitude, even as it reminds us that the outcome of engaged solitude is an intensification of a sense of togetherness. Everything worthwhile is done with other people. Uh, if the events of the last year, a global pandemic, uh, the police murder of George Floyd broadcast in real time, revolutionary efforts to defund police, uh, if these have made anything clear, it's that real change requires collective action in order to be effectuated and sustained. The extraordinary vacuum of distancing and self-isolation uh, has shifted our focus from subjective experiences to a collective understanding of shared struggle. As Caroline Jones uh, suggested last year in Art Forum, the proliferating RNA virus must turn our thinking from selves to our species monoculture on the planet. And I think it has. As we considered a path forward, our attention was drawn to artists whose practices imagine or create futurities or whose works grapple with the histories contained within objects and ourselves in order to consider new modes of seeing history and each other. A Dallas-based artist, Jatavia Gary's recent uh, spectacular experimental film work, uh, The Giverny Suite, um, which of, uh, is a, <clears throat> this image is uh, here, um, uh, which will have its Texas debut in the, uh, the biennial exhibition uh, that we will be co-curating at PhotoFest Houston with uh, Max Fields, uh, uses the verdant and distinctly European backdrop of Monet's famous gardens to frame the image of her black body and the lived experiences of black women. The film combines archival images and sound, handmade celluloid animations, and Giverny Flora with documentary footage of Gary interviewing black women on the street in Harlem. The question that frames these interviews and the film, do you feel safe in your body? also recontextualizes footage of black icons and civil rights activists, Nina Simone, excuse me, Josephine Baker and Fred Hampton. Celluloid distortions and black and white images of drone strike footage after the landscape, alter the landscape of Gary's film as she interrogates black women about their feelings of safety. Um, Dr. Ayana Doz Dozier uh, wrote about uh, Gary's Giverny Suite for uh, the summer issue of Gulf Coast, uh, which is a, a literary journal published uh, in Houston. Uh, and in that uh, essay, she wrote, uh, the replies of these women, uh, which um, Gary has interviewed, do, do not resolve the question, but rather reveal how for black women and girls, safety is always a negotiation with the world and oneself amid a backdrop of white supremacy and patriarchal terror. Um, histories are contained within objects. Um, this, is a, uh, this has been a central theme uh, for our project and for the biennial, uh, and one that we are particularly interested in investigating uh, through the project. This idea is explored by several artists in the biennial, uh, and there are few American sculptors more synonymous with the memory of materials than Melvin Edwards. Born in Houston in 1937 and raised in Fifth Ward, Mel is a master sculptor who has welded race, politics, and steel for more than 60 years. Edwards' lynch fragments, his ongoing series of welded and gnarled assemblage reliefs, recall the shackles of chattel slavery, the distortion and violence of Jim Crow, and the anthropomorphous dignity of African masks. Although first produced in 1963 in response to violence experienced by Black Americans, the lynch fragments have since been informed by anti-war activism, the memorialization of individuals, and various African metalworking traditions and histories. In doing so, Edwards invites a multivalent context and potentiality into these objects that is collectively greater than the trauma that bore them. Uh, it's, it's been an incredible experience uh, to be able to, to work with an artist, uh, an octogenarian artist like Mel, uh, who's been uh, working within these themes uh, for so long 
and we have been so pleased to learn of his relationships and influence on other artists in the project. So in thinking about these new futures and thinking about um, these uh, incredible connections and points of entry into art making practices uh, by artists either from Texas or deeply related to Texas, uh, it's been an incredibly uh, rewarding experience. Um, this is work by Sandra Perry that was uh, recently installed at the Shed in New York. Sandra Perry, <coughs> excuse me, uh, was a core fellow uh, in the core program at the Glassell School of Art at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston for a number of years. And uh, Sandra also has um, extensive friends and family uh, in, um, in uh, Northeast Texas and throughout Texas. Sandra's interdisciplinary practice is concerned with technologies of representation and particularly how blackness is reflected, depicted, surveilled, or emerges from within technological and virtual frameworks. Her 2019 installation, You Out Here Looking Like You Don't Belong to Nobody, Heavy Metal and Reflective, is in many ways interested in the same political and contextual history of iron alloys explored by Mel Edwards. Uh, Perry's installation combines a, um, uh, excuse me, uh, her installation combines a large iron casting crucible, which uh, is kind of barely visible within this photo, but it's the large black object on the floor. Um, that crucible is complete with a um, LCD display on its top. Uh, there is a ceiling mounted video above it, which features images of 18th and 19th century iron shackles. Uh, and then there is a pyramidal sculptural object uh, whose upturned base is a metal aggregate of railroad spikes, iron oxide, and iron-based meteorites. Contained within each of these metal objects is the astrological life of a meteoric rock whose four billion year orbit around the earth ended with their metallurgic transformation by men into discrete tools of bondage. For Perry, the material history of these objects offers opportunities for recontextualization and new possibilities for their life as instruments in digital production. Uh, issues of immigrant justice are central to the collaborative duo of LA-based artists Castles and Rafa Esparza and their ongoing project In Plain Sight, uh, which is a coalition of more than 80 artists uh, who over the 4th of July weekend in 2020 uh, identified the locations of immigrant detention centers uh, across the United States and Texas, uh, the Southwestern United States specifically, uh, and overhead uh, displayed messages uh, via fleets of sky typing planes. Uh, the text uh, was, uh, uh, each of the texts at each location was a collaboration by um, uh, artists and immigrants. Um, IPS or In Plain Sight also deeply engaged the needs of immigrant communities through extensive community building with migrants uh, and more than 30 organizations on the ground in, in Texas, California, and the southeastern United States, excuse me, southwestern United States. Sadly, because these facilities still exist and are expanding uh, within the new administration, Castles and Esparza's work for the Texas Biennial is a continuation of IPS uh, with the addition of AR or augmented reality uh, technology, uh, which will display artist generated messages in skywriting at the geolocation of new and existing detention centers across Texas. Everything worthwhile is done with other people. Activism and uh, political intervention were fundamental to the early work of San Antonio native and New York artist, Donald Moffat. Uh, Moffat was a founding member of Grand Fury, uh, the agitprop artist collective that emerged from the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power or ACT UP New York in 1988. Um, Moffat is now living and working through the second epidemic of his lifetime, uh, which he experienced primarily in self-isolation on his ranch in South Central Texas last year. Um, uh, even though COVID is much more in people's consciousness than HIV AIDS, uh, Moffat recently explained in an interview to Art Forum, there are again great political divides 
between those who must risk their health and those who can afford to isolate uh, and between those who wear a mask and those who refuse, which is a tension I've been witnessing here in Texas and everywhere really. Moffat's recent glory hole paintings, which precede the pandemic, have since sprung into organic cellular mutations like the porous virions, like porous virions coated in candy paint. Not long into the making of this series, the New York City Department of Health released guidelines, which detailed safe sex options during the pandemic, including the use of physical barriers like walls. From Donald again, quote, there's no worry of COVID in a glory hole where breathing takes place on opposite sides of the wall. <clears throat> but masking is another form of anonymity, less sexual maybe, mysterious, but still very heightened in a social context. COVID is just a, a subset of a larger aberration in nature with people as vector. On January 10th, 1901, a well at the Spindletop oil field in Beaumont, Texas struck oil and it was a gusher. The role of Texas as the singular point of origin in the history of the petroleum industry and its effect on global climate 120 years later uh, are examined by Irish artist John Gerard in his towering wall scale animation, Western Flag, Spindletop, Texas, 2017. The work is a large scale simulation of the now barren site of the Lucas Gusher, uh, which Gerard has reimagined with a flagpole at its center, bearing a flag of perpetually billowing black smoke. In a sense, Gerard's animation represents the environmental opposite of the American flag on the lunar surface, though the vehicles used to reach each site are powered by the same fuel. Western flag and Gerard's other reimagined virtual sculptures of the Texas landscape in his past work, are the product of extensive archival research and underscore the global impact of the human corruption of the natural environment. And Gerard's inclusion is also significant in that it marks the inclusion of an international artist uh, for whom Texas and its history are subject matter. Uh, Texas is a geographical and cultural study in contrast um, and uh, this is a, it's a, it's a fact that is actually, that is uh, really humorously and, and beautifully conveyed by this work by Philip Pyle, who is a Houston based artist. And uh, this work is, uh, this is called Broken Obelisk Elbows, uh, which is actually, this is uh, imagined as a proposed monument uh, for uh, a project of the um, Highline Network Joint Art Initiative. Uh, and uh, Ryan and I were just so moved by this idea of putting elbows on uh, Barnett Newman's Broken Obelisk. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with elbows, uh, they are the, um, those are the, uh, the beautiful gold uh, three-dimensional uh, hubcaps that you can see on the side of that structure. And um, elbows are a, a, a really important part of slab culture, uh, which is a, a, is a very unique Houston subculture of uh, beautiful car aficionados it's where this, the term candy paint that I used previously comes from. Uh, it is absolutely worth a Google search if you are not familiar with Houston's uh, slab culture. I, I recommend looking into it. But this work is a, is a way of imagining um, a, a new monument. It's a new idea for a new city. Uh, it imagines a world in which this work, which, uh, by the way, Broken Obelisk, which is installed outside of the Rothko Chapel in Houston, uh, was dedicated in memory of uh, Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So um, there's a real uh, connection here between issues of uh, equality um, and uh, issues of racial and social justice that I just thought were really beautiful. Uh, and Philip will be uh, creating uh, a large scale print uh, of this version for our, um, for our uh, presentation. Uh, Texas is a, a geographical, as I mentioned previously, is a geographical and, and cultural study in contrasts its vast expanse and diversity can't be summed up or described in any singular way or through any one experience. Uh, as curators, we understood this to be an expansive framework on which to build a project like the Texas Biennial uh, and an invitation to organize a project that is intergenerational, international in scope, 
uh, richly diverse and abundantly transdisciplinary. Um, El Paso native and uh, New York based painter Virginia Jaramillo and uh, sculptor Mel Edwards are late career artists in their early 80s, uh, while some, excuse me, while some are recent MFA grads. Um, uh, and like Dallas based artist Ari Brielle, uh, Marfa based artist uh, Xavier McFarlane, uh, you know, recent MFA H core fellow uh, Ryan Hawk. Um, so there's a there's an incredible um, breadth of uh, types of artists and where these artists are in their careers. Talented mid career artists like Mumbai born Abidnya Guga, uh, Denton's Annette Lawrence, uh, although now she's moving up to uh, to Vermont, uh, and Houston's Kaneem Smith were all really uh, central to and essential to this conversation, um, as were uh, performance performers like. Uh, Christine's, Paul Swallow, uh, composers, oh, excuse me, artist collectives like the Philippine X Artists of Houston and House of Kenzo from San Antonio, uh, composers like Graham Reynolds, uh, and groundbreaking filmmakers like uh, PJ Raval and uh, Jatavia Gary. Um, perhaps Bell Hooks was right, and the outcome of engaged solitude truly is an intensification of a sense of togetherness. Everything worthwhile is done with other people. Through the work of dozens of exceptional artists, educators, activists, and practitioners, the 2021 Texas Biennial imagines itself as an iterative and expansive source of agency and collective potentiality. It is the product of radical transformations in collective action and awareness catalyzed by a global pandemic and worldwide demonstrations in defense of Black, AAPI, Palestinian, and trans lives. Rather than center narratives of destruction and trauma, the project is an artist-driven collaborative effort to imagine and build a way forward. Mariame Kaba says it perfectly, artists are there as the people to help us think through it. Why does this have to be? It doesn't have to be like this you can think of something totally fucking different. Why are you all stuck in the presentest moment? You can dream a future. We need that so desperately in the world. Um, I, wanted to, um, I wanted to close uh, with these images of uh, <laughs> screen grabs from Zoom. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm sure these images look incredibly familiar to everyone who's here. This is essentially the way that we've been able to communicate and meet uh, in, you know, over the course of the last really 15 months. Um, and uh, this was a, a really beautiful screen grab with uh, Sandra Perry uh, making a, a cute little heart. I don't know if you can see it, it's pretty tiny. Um, and then uh, here's Ryan at home with um, Amit. And uh, this is Rigo Luna, um, without whom this, the entire project would, would seriously not be possible. Um, Rigo is our uh, production and curatorial assistant and uh, is really just a huge powerhouse and uh, would not be, I wanted to take a moment to, uh, to uh, call him out and to, uh, to, to offer my thanks because it would, the whole project would just not be possible uh, without him. Um, but yeah, I, I just, um, I wanted to make Kaba's work and her, excuse me, her language, uh, her sentiments, the focus of this talk um, um, because I, I do feel really strongly that um, if there's anything that uh, I've learned uh, in the last year, it's that everything worthwhile truly is done with other people. Um, and uh, if, uh, as I mentioned previously, if there was any lesson that I feel like I've learned uh, or that culturally that we've learned as a species, as a, as a, as a nation, as a human species, as a culture, um, it's that when we come together, change really is possible. It's not just a, uh, it's not just some quote on the wall of a kindergarten classroom. I mean, it really is possible. Um, and when you think about uh, the um, historical narratives of change, when you think about um, the abolitionist movement, the anti-slavery movement, the civil rights movement, the you know uh, what we used to call the gay rights movement, um, the LGBT, LGBTQ rights movement trans rights movement. Um, these are all movements of people together, working together collaboratively in the face of death, violence, trauma, 
uh, jail. Uh, the, uh, the challenges uh, to each of these groups have been enormous and yet change uh, was within reach in, in every instance. And it, and it still is. Um, so I hope that um, I hope that I've offered a little bit of a, a window into sort of what some of these uh, what some of the challenges presented by us uh, sort of looked like. Um, by the way, this is the uh, this is a, a little bit of information about our about the project, um, which will take place in five uh, museums across Texas. Um, a little uh, sort of personal side note is that. Um, and I brought this up to my class on uh, on Saturday, but um, uh, as, a, as a way of sort of trying to demystify sort of how something like this could be possible, um, I'll just say quickly as uh, in closing that we knew that there was a likelihood that it was possible that the um, some uh, museum partners in Texas and their exhibition calendars may have been disrupted by COVID. And we thought that that opportunity, that there was an opportunity there to create a conversation with these institutions uh, that we could um, that we could build something together that could be collaborative and unlike any other previous iteration of the Texas Biennial. And what we found were a host of institutions in San Antonio, Art Pace, the McNay, Ruby City, San Antonio Museum of Art, um, and Photo Fests, and folks like Stephen Evans and Max Fields there who were so enthusiastic about breaking from the traditional um, model and who were so enthusiastic about uh, a vision of uh, creating a new, imagining a new future with these artists. Um, so it's, uh, it, was a, it was kismet, it was really meant by, by the universe to play out in this way. And uh, we've just been so incredibly grateful. Um, and um, yeah, it's been an incredible, uh, incredible learning experience. Um, but um, yeah, I think that I'll I think that I'll stop there and can probably take questions. Uh, great, can we all unmute and give Evan a round of applause? Thank you, Evan. Uh, and again, if folks have questions, uh, please do a raise hand or or put it in the chat. Um, but I just want to start, uh, Evan, and thank you so much for such an, uh, an open and generous uh, talk, especially um, around your own. Uh, personal experience of moving to DC in the midst of these enormous social disruptions. Um, but I was curious about, um, in terms of putting together the biennial, it seems like, uh, you know, because Texas looms large in all of our imaginations as Americans, but it's, it's always filled with a kind of um, mythology or uh, it just seems like some other place. Um, and so is, is part of, um, I guess my three-part question is, you know, how does the uh, the intimacy of that collaboration become visible to the audience? Um, and then uh, how does, you know, because even understanding what the Texas Biennial is about for someone outside of Texas with very little relationship to Texas is amazing and fascinating. And so I wondered about um, the sort of, uh, the audience, which is part of the, the identity of Texas, and then the audience outside of that, and, and that kind of dimension, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, you know, as to whether, as to whether that intimacy becomes visible, um, that's a that's actually a really really good question. I don't know if I have an answer for that. Um, I think, <clears throat> I think if anything, um, what we most hope to become visible is that the project is deeply collaborative. Um, so at every point in the project from artist selection to um, you know, uh, object selection or, or you know, proposed performance uh, selection, et cetera, at every turn we've asked you know, the artist or uh, the, uh, the exhibition partner um, or the artist collective, we've asked them for feedback or we asked them what their what they would most like to do, um, and uh, so it's it's. I think I think curators have kind of a funny problem very often where um, I think for a lot of curators, I think they would like to they would like to call all of the shots and create the entire experience for the viewer. You know, from the moment that you walk into the room until the moment that you leave the museum, and 
I think um, the type of curators that Ryan and I are, are we're, I think we're, we're, we're predominantly interested in process uh, and we're incredibly interested in uh, the collaborative process. So for us, um, it's, it's, it has really less been about, I think, our vision for the checklist or our vision for the project and, and much more so about um, trying to determine what is the best uh, and what is the best way for your work as an artist to be displayed, um, you know, given this like tiny micro budget that we're playing with, which I think is the challenge for pretty much every institution is like, how can you make a dollar out of 15 cents? Um, I think to the, to your question about um, these, you know, the, how Texas looms large and like um, the, the audience, the Texas audience, for example, you know, I think the best way to answer that question is that Ryan and I are both Houstonians. Um, you know, uh, Ryan was born in Houston and then raised in San Antonio and then came back to Houston. And I, I was there for 25 years before I moved to Boston. And I think, I think the way that we think about Texas is, is reflected in how we think about Houston, which is that it is this incredibly diverse place. Um, anybody that knows me personally knows that I like really get in my feelings and get frustrated with folks when they try to put Texas in a very conservative box or when they when folks try to put Texas uh, when people try to define Texas by the legislature that controls it and I think that's a really fucked up problem um, because I'll be really candid you know I lived in Boston for seven years um, and this is after I lived in Texas for 25 years. But it was, I wasn't called a faggot on the street until I moved to Boston. I mean, I lived in Texas for 25 years before this happened to me for the first time in a liberal oasis like Massachusetts. Um, so ignorance can exist literally anywhere. Um, and I, so, so that's one note is that uh, I think Texas, the Texas and the audiences in Texas, the, the minds in Texas are so much more broad and open than I think how popular culture uh, frames the state of Texas. So that's one thing that I think we had to kind of constantly be aware of that we were sort of at all times working against this, um, like this notion that Texas is, uh, you know, sort of a, an incredibly, that it's dominated by conservative thought uh, or by limited for, or ignorant thought. Um, the second is that, you know, we're, we're public art curators. We're just so interested in um, an engagement that we knew this was going to be a community building project. So a number of the artists uh, who are working in, um, in programs and, and who are part of the exhibition in San Antonio will actually be doing, you know, community outreach in San Antonio, reaching out to folks and, and uh, their programs will be um, executed in concert with a number of these communities in San Antonio, which is great. Um, I don't know, I hope that's like, I hope that's an answer to your question. You know, it, it is because, um, yeah, I think, you know, I've been to Texas several times. It's just it's so complicated. It's like, it's, it's so big, it's so yeah. diverse in terms of background and history and landscape. Um, and it's so hard to put one's finger on, on how to define that. And, and in a weird way, it's almost maybe how all of America looks to the rest of the world. Is like I was just about to say that. I was yeah. just about to say that it's, it's like, and, it's, and I, I wrote about that too, you know, and I, I mentioned that in my talk is that it's impossible to define Texas in one specific way. And any attempt to try to put it in a box uh, will be, a, that's a, it will be a futile exercise. Um, mm -hmm. If you th just think geographically about Texas, right? So on the east side of Texas, you have Louisiana. Um, and I'm, I'm from Southeast Texas on the Gulf. Um, Gulf, the Gulf of Mexico culture or like Southeast Texas culture is an entirely different universe than the type of culture that you see in El Paso or the Panhandle, for example. And this is for a number of reasons. Um, Houston has the largest Vietnamese population per capita in the United States. That has everything to do with the fact that uh, before, during, and after the Vietnam War, um, Vietnamese migrants were sent from Vietnam to the Gulf of Mexico. That is where many of them, uh, you know, uh, that's where many of them were relocated. 
um, which is why you have such a huge presence of Vietnamese folks in Houston, but also in Louisiana and all along the Gulf, which is how you get something as spectacular as Viet Cajun crawfish. Um, you know, it is, uh, it's the product of an immigrant city um, that is, uh, you know, just bustling with, uh, you know, different, in a region that is bustling with different kinds of folks, different identities. Um, you know, the way that I try and characterize Texas is that it's, you know, uh, a lot of folks will text from Texas will tell you that Texas is not the South. And uh, what they mean by that is that um, it exists it, it exists beyond the South. So it is a, it is literally the, the state that is most due South in the, you know, in the United States. Um, but it is a bridge between the, what we, what we actually refer to as the South um, and uh, the American West. It's, it's, it's literally a geographic bridge between the West and the South. And so it exists in both uh, worlds. Um, it's also, you know, it's a, it's a huge, um, Houston, sorry, Texas has a huge international population. So for all of these reasons, we just felt that um, our artist criteria had to be expanded. We had to think expansively about our curatorial framework. Um, you know, uh, something that I failed to mention in my talk is that, you know, we're building an app, uh, which was a conversation that we started really mid pandemic, given that we didn't know if folks were going to be able to physically make it to Texas to see this exhibition. So the app is also a way to connect folks in a virtual <clears> room <throat> to introduce the work of these artists. Um, so we were really taking uh, all of these things into consideration. And I think uh, the pandemic really kind of complicated a lot of those things, but it also really clarified them for us too. Thank you, Evan. Uh, I see a question from John Fall. Good morning. Thank you, Evan, for your uh, candid talk. I have a question about the phenomenon of the pandemic. In your uh, view, how do you think our ideas of the figure of the human body has changed? Um, how do you think the pandemic has changed our ideas of how we see our human bodies? That is a great question. Um, um, I think we now see them as larger containers for home baked bread. Um, maybe that's like the, sh maybe that's a short version. Um, you know, I don't know. I don't know if, um, well, I mean, there are as many human relationships to the human body as there are humans. Um, and so perhaps that's maybe the best way to answer that. Um, I think, I think, well, I mean, maybe the better way for me to answer that is that, um, you know, and I, and, I, and I spoke about this to a certain degree in the talk too, which is that I think for me personally, it's, it's emphasized that um, uh, the world does not operate at the hands of any one of us. Um, it requires, it requires publics, it requires communities of individuals, it requires communities of change makers, um, and uh, it requires people working together in unison for, for you know, and, and towards a common goal. Um, I think, you know, I think if you're uh, someone who's uh, kind of a germaphobe, it was probably like a really terrifying year, probably still is, or probably will continue to be. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I have a good answer for how the pandemic has changed our relationship to our bodies. I think if anything, it's, uh, I mean, certainly for me, it certainly made us more aware of our own, of the limitations of our own body. Perhaps maybe that's the best way to, to answer that. Thank you so much. Uh, I see a question from Oliver and then one from Steve. Sorry. Um, thanks, Evan. I, I admire your ability to pull off this show so well under what must have been difficult circumstances. Um, are people hearing me? Yeah. You are, okay. 
Uh, sorry. Um, I'm curious, so much of, uh, so many shows now, um, I think for better, tend to involve community as much as possible, uh, whether it's through, while, while exhibitions are up, through sort of outreach programs or going into communities or public art that is an extension of the exhibition itself. Well, did you have plans to do any of that that was curtailed uh, by the circumstances of COVID or did you manage to do some of it? Um, that's a great question. I have sort of two answers. One is that we'd, we'd made plans for um, a public art component um, that we'd originally hoped to install in Marfa. Um, that didn't happen uh, not because of COVID. Uh, COVID was not the reason that that didn't work out. There were other, other complications. Um, uh, however, performance and interactive works um, were where we faced our, our biggest challenges. Um, I'll be candid and say that that is shifting um, just as uh, public health guidelines are shifting, just as museums are reconsidering uh, how they are, you know, um, uh, how they are taking public health um, into, into consideration with the decisions that are made. Um, but um, yeah, it was absolutely, you know, uh, an issue. I, do, I think rather than, uh, you know, make make plans that then didn't happen. I think, you know, I'll be also I'll be you know candid and say that you know we um, once COVID hit in March, all of our plans sort of like for our checklist, like for the actual individual works, like that was that was that went on pause for, I mean, uh, several months uh, because we, at that point we didn't feel that we had enough information. Uh, the CDC didn't even have enough information. Uh, to make uh, an intelligent decision uh, about how to move forward. So there were questions about things like, okay, well, if someone has a work that needs to be displayed on a monitor, do we use headphones? Um, you know, we, there's a, you know, Steve Parker, who's a brilliant artist, sound artist from Austin, uh, who's currently at the American Academy in Rome. Um, you know, uh, his work is also incredibly interactive. I think we had to think differently about which work of his we would choose, um, you know, which work the, uh, the host museum would be most interested in exhibiting given these new sort of public health guidelines. Um, you know, uh, and I'm thinking of a work specifically where, uh, you know, the one of the first works of his that we were pre predominantly interested in, uh, you put on a headset and the headset has um, uh, essentially like horns, uh, like uh, instrument horns that sort of come out and you, you then move uh, across a wall. And so again, anything that, had, that you were physically touching, we had to kind of think differently about. Um, but yeah, I think um, as, as so many museums have also uh, done and, and considered public art in public spaces outdoors is a direction that many, many museums have had to rely on the Hirschhorn here in DC is still closed, but the sculpture park is open. Um, you know, uh, IMA in Ireland, the Irish Museum of Modern Art, where, where I'll be headed for my Fulbright this fall, they closed their uh, museum and instead they've uh, introduced IMA Outdoors, which is an entire program of public art and performance that is, you know, COVID safe since it's all outdoors. So that was essentially the kind of direction that we had been considering. And then uh, uh, based on our conversations and our needs, we we essentially shifted the the focus to just San Antonio and Houston, uh, where we could kind of uh, make some of these things happen without, you know, asking folks to go all the way out to to Marfa, for example. But yeah, thank you for that question. I, I imagine that a lot of museums also have developed uh, online uh, uh, programming that that was in the works possibly, but was, was accelerated by the conditions of COVID. Yes, I mean, we were terrified at first that we were gonna have to have a virtual exhibition, which um, anybody, any of my students who took my class or are in my class know that that would be like a total nightmare for me personally. Um, so I'm glad that we've been able to move things into a physical realm and that we'll, uh, we've had, you know, the incredible generosity of these five museums uh, for the project. But yeah, it's been, um, 
I mean, I think the, the best way to describe it is that um, it's clarified so much. The pandemic has clarified so much for so many folks. And I don't just mean for us personally for this project, and I don't just mean for artists or the art world, but for everyone. I think everyone realized like, okay, dude, you've got a, if you have a bucket list, maybe you should start thinking about plugging away at that list now, because who knows how long we have on this earth? How do you want to spend your time on this planet? Um, these were all things that you know were sort of happening in real time. These questions were happening in real time while we were working on the project. And I think given that we were so interested in uh, looking forwards, you know, as, as so many contemporary biennials often try to do, I think we sort of tried to sort of um, transform all of this new awareness about uh, the, all these new questions that, that sort of came up during COVID and really apply them, you know, to the project and how we most wanted to see the project exist in the world and how our artists wanted to see their work uh, you know, in relation to the project exist in the world. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Steve has a question and then Dee. Hey, Evan, uh, my question, well, mine's more of a comment than a question. Um, the first one was about the piece that uh, you chose from Philip Ply. Ply? Um, mm -hmm. Pyle. Mm -hmm. Pyle, thank you. Um, that piece is so dope. Like when you, as soon as you mentioned like the elbows and then I was like, wait, that's kind of like the slab culture and all that. And I low key just wanted to say a Paul Wall quote just out of it or and talk about candy paint. Um, but I thought that was really cool. Just that connection. Cause initially when I looked at it, I was like, what the heck is this? But then I saw that those like elbows and I was like, wait, that looks familiar. So I'm sorry, I'm in school right now and that's the bell to leave. Um, but I, oh Jesus. So my question is this, how do you choose the people? How do you choose the artists? Do you go through Instagram? Are you connecting with people? How do you do it? That's a great question. Um, you know, it's, um, it's, what is the best way to answer this question? Um, well, first of all, you know, we're doing this together. So it's a curatorial process. And so therefore it's a conversation. And so for me and Ryan, that conversation is uh, sort of just like you described. I will like, I'll send, you know, in the, over the last, you know, 18 months, for example, I might see something by an artist who we're already paying attention to or who's already on a short list. Um, maybe the best place for me to start is that um, we started a Google document at the very beginning of the project where we would literally just list names. So no titles, no bodies of work, like just an artist's name. And that, that list just began to, you know, populate It began to grow and grow and grow. And then those were artists that we were considering inviting to be included in the biennial. Uh, in tandem with that, every year, or excuse me, every biennial, Big Medium uh, uh, has an open call where artists across Texas can apply to be considered for the biennial. So we have this, we had this pool of over um, you know, 700 artists that applied to this open call that we went through over a series of months, work by work, artist by artist, to you know see if any of these artists were of interest to us. Um, you know, from that 750, I think we chose like 15 or 20 of those artists to be included in the biennial. And then the other folks were were uh, artists that we person that we individually invited to be part of the conversation. And the way that those decisions got made really was that we were you know. Once we'd, um, once we'd begun the initial conversation about um, what type of, of um, conversation we were interested in having, you know, we knew that we wanted it to be, um, you know, um, black indigenous, uh, person of color, queer slash trans focused. We knew, you know, um, both, you know, Ryan's work has really been dedicated to black artists, black community building, community building period. Uh, and, and my work, my curatorial work has really been dedicated to um, artists who have been art historically marginalized. So women, you know, black artists, artists of color, queer people. Um, and so we, we knew from the outset that if it was me and Ryan, that there was going to be a focus there and that there was always, there was also going to be a public art focus. And then it really just became a, a conversation, you know, who's, who's doing what. Um, this could be a really, you know, beautiful presentation. Uh, we think that this conversation is really important to have. Um, and then, you know, uh, again, there are folks who 
uh, from Texas who we felt like really, really deserved a bigger platform. You know, and I'm talking about folks like Kaneem Smith, who is a brilliant sculptor uh, in, from Houston, um, Abidnia Guga, uh, who was born in Mumbai and living in, uh, in Texas. And um, so it was also really about raising up folks who we knew were making spectacular work and, and wanted to offer them a, a greater platform to exhibit their work. So um, there are so many factors that go into a decision about who gets selected and how. Um, I think for any curator, it's about how an artist's vision or how an artist's work fits into the mold that the curator is sort of making. Their, you know, a curator is building an experience for a viewer that experience in this case has both a contemporary context and a historical context. So there's like, you know, there are just layers and layers of, um, of variables in terms of, uh, you know, who gets picked and, and why. Um, and I think, you know, uh, just like any other decision in life, I think gut decisions also, um, you know, are, are really um, important because they, they speak to something that you, that, you're, that yourself knows, that your body knows, that maybe your mind isn't immediately aware of. Um, and also, you know, because it's a, a, a collaboration between me and a, and a co-curator, Ryan, it's also a, very much a, a conversation. So we're learning from each other at the same time. Um, what I will say is that, you know, Ryan was my first curator buddy that I made when I moved back to Houston in 2016. Uh, we juried uh, Artadia together. And um, from the jump, I just, I felt like Ryan was my sister. Like my, she was born in, in 84, like my sister, she actually, she gave birth to her child within a month of my, my bio sister giving birth to a child. So there were like all of these, um, uh, there are all these really beautiful connections between the two of us. And so again, it was just a conversation throughout the, the entire process. Uh, and Dee has a question. Thank you so much. Um, I feel like in a lot of my time in Leslie, I've been thinking a lot about like what an art career looks like or like how to do one that centers like justice and community and I feel like it was really hopeful for me to like watch and hear with the amount of intentionality and care that you're putting into this work and I'm really grateful to like be able to learn from you um one of the you started to speak about it just now a little bit around like this quote that you keep um referencing Mariam Kaba who I so love so deeply um around like everything we're doing is worth doing with other people. Um, how have you been managing relationships to care? And like, how have you been managing your interactions and like care for yourself and for your community throughout this process? I'm really just like interested in like the level of like trauma that we've all experienced over the last year and plus. Um, from a variety of sources, like in while doing such an intense project, um, what does care look like for you and, and how are you navigating it? I guess, I don't know if that's, it. yeah. No, I think that's a good question. Um, poorly is the short version. <laughs> um, that's the short answer. Um, Ryan and I check in with each other every day or every other day. Um, and uh, part of me, uh, wishes that we could publish our text history because it's fabulous. Um, you know, we ch I think we are we are the only ones checking in on each other. I mean, of course, in addition to our own, you know, individual networks, you know, our, our spouses, our family, our, our chosen family. Um, but um, yeah, it's tough. It's really hard, especially, you know, I can only imagine also what, what how Ryan is juggling it because She's a mother, she's a chief curator at an institution. There are other projects that she's organizing while we're working on this as well. So um, the, the need for care and the, the need for awareness of that care is not equal among all partners. So I find that I'm, I, I'm you know, we, we, che we check in with each other pretty regularly. In terms of, you know, care with the artists that we are working with, that is incredibly important to the two of us. And, um, you know, in this field, uh, for, for me personally, as a curator, 
it's been my experience that uh, individual and personal relationships are really key. Uh, not only you know for your own happiness and well-being, but for that of the folks that you work with. Um, and of course, just with anything, that's that's like the product of making mistakes. So you know that's the product of like you know having 15 years in the field where perhaps you know like in a, a past example, someone didn't feel like they had been heard when we were building a checklist for a program. Those things really sit in your brain, um, and you you. you for me personally, really want to make um, a just and um, candid and careful consideration and conversation with each artist. You know, it's difficult when the only way to connect with these folks is via Zoom, like or, or by phone, and that's really hard because um, you know so much of the work that we do as curators is in the studio and. I'm the type of curator that is just really uh, excited and motivated by what takes place in the studio. So to only have uh, like a virtual access to that means that there's only, it means that all of the like care um, that I have to put into that interaction has to be funneled through the internet tubes into Zoom, you know, uh, and through my own words and actions. And maybe that's the better answer is that words and actions, actions, certainly more than words, um, are incredibly important. So listening is really key. Um, that's also, that's really hard to do when you're juggling like 54 artists, for example, you know, with this biennial. So um, it's tough, it's really not easy and you just have to listen. It's really so much about listening. And then once you do the active listening, then you can sort of take a look at all of your, the blueprints for all of your plans and say, well, X artist really feels strongly about this. How can we accommodate that based on what we've got available? It's really all about managing relationships and expectations. Care, however, I think has been really, really difficult. Um, you know, uh, I am the, uh, the type of person where I uh, just, I tend to put my individual care last and the care of others first. Um, that has changed a lot in the last uh, 15 months. Um, I've, I've really learned how important it is to, to put your own care first, because then you then, once you're taking care of yourself, you can then take care of others in a much more uh, efficient and proactive and careful way. But it's tough, I guess that's the, that's the short version is like it's very, very difficult to do. And it's a lot easier to do in the real world where all of those nonverbal communications uh, are there, and you know, in Zoom, you just have uh, what goes in the chat and what what's said. So, listening is really important. I even uh, following up on Dee's question, I'm wondering, you know, because the premise of the talk is is about kind of uh, collective action, and so I'm I'm curious what suggestions you would give to artists on how they could work together. Um, you know, it may not be towards the collaboration of new artworks, but because um, I think a lot of visual artists tend to not think about working together and, and what could be produced from that. So I'm curious um, what you see as some paths that artists can take, and especially during a pandemic or as a pandemic takes on this other form, um, what do you find are meaningful ways uh, artists can, can collaborate? That's a great question. Um, you know, um, in my studio visits with artists um, and in my conversations with folks, um, I constantly, excuse me, I constantly push artists to, um, it's sort of like that phrase, um, you know, like make the change you wish to see in the world. Um, excuse me. Um, that is applicable to studio practice, it's applicable to curatorial practice, it's applicable to collaborative practice. Um, so I guess what I would say is to any artist or artists who have a desire to um, collaborate or to work together or to create a community of individuals, um, my advice would be to fucking do it, just do it. Um, and. I mean, in terms of how to do it, that, that obviously will depend on, you know, the nature of your work, the nature of your interests, the nature of the, the collaboration. Um, I guess, you know, uh, in 2011, I, I co-founded Fire Island Artist Residency, 
uh, with Chris Boja and we had no, no nonprofit experience whatsoever, none. Uh, we had a wish and a desire to bring artists to this incredibly history queer place and then just see what happens. And that was like the origin point was like that that was the thing that we wanted. And so in order for us to do that, we were going to need money. So the, the first year was self-funded and the second year, um, you know, Jim Hodges was kind enough to donate 30 editions and we sold those and th those funds gave us the opportunity to do a second year and then it just sort of kept going from there. Um, I think, so perhaps maybe the better answer is like, do it and worry about it later or like get started and the collaboration will then happen. Um, you know, it's sort of like, it's, it's like asking the question, like, how do you, how do you make a snowball? Well, you can make a snowball by like picking up some snow and picking up some other snow and then kind of like packing them together. Or you can take a bit of snow and toss it down a hill and it will just accumulate and accumulate and accumulate. Um, but nothing happens without that initial inertia. Nothing happens without you actually doing the work to pick up the snow. Someone else picks up some snow or you're, you know, some other element and then you put those things together or you set the thing in motion down the hill. Um, I think um, it's just so important if there's, a, if there's an impulse, if there's a desire to meet with other folks, <clears throat> to collaborate with other folks. Um, I guess that's the other thing that I would say is that like do it outside of the digital realm, you know, bring the work out into, or that collaboration, that project into the real world, make it, make it real. Um, and, you know, of course you can start online, you know, you can gather people online. Um, there's a, there's a reason we call it social media for a reason, but I think it's, um, it's important to, uh, in order to like actuate the change or in order to, actuate the collaboration it's just so important for you to pull the trigger in whatever way that looks like so um I think a great example might be in plain sight the that collaboration of more than 80 artists um that uh castles and rafa esparza you know really catalyzed um you know uh, first in in los angeles and then the project expanded um, and all of these folks who were just as passionate about immigrant and migrant activism were part of that project. Um, they used social media to connect with other folks and, um, and then worked with, with organizations on the ground to do that work. I think that's actually, I would look to that example as a, as a great example of artists wanting to create change together. Um, uh, you also, you would not believe the incredible and beautiful people that you will meet at a protest. Um, if, if, you're, if your work is interested in, uh, in politics, um, but also just as someone who's interested in, in community building, um, there are opportunities to, um, you know, for, for networking, for ideas, for creative placemaking, um, uh, basically everywhere. I think it's a matter of uh, trying to... Um, uh, you know, just use taking your guts and then applying them and pushing this thing or your vision or your need to connect with folks out in the world. You know, it's, it's, it's just how ACT UP started. And, you know, in the mid 1980s, they were a bunch of pissed off queer people, you know, um, a lot of lesbians and gay guys who just wanted to get uh, out into the street and get angry. And they really needed to organize if they were in order, they wanted to create change. And then they started meeting, the meetings grew. And then at those meetings, they were like, okay, well, we need some sort of visual component. How many of you are artists? The artists raised their hand. They then went into a corner and that is how Grand Fury was born. I mean, it was literally born out of this, uh, you know, uh, political activism, AIDS activism meeting. Um, so there are opportunities uh, for these kinds of, you know, for all manner of collaborations, um, Basically, everywhere you look, you just have to be eager to find them and and be ready to um, to organize and uh, to collaborate. Great, thank you, Evan. Um, okay, so we'll do two more questions. Um, I see one from Craig, and then Rich can have the last one. There we are. Found the mute. Um, 
I am curious about history, art history. And um, I was interested in the piece you uh, introduced, the film piece the, uh, about Giverny. And, and um, I, I, I have a hypothesis that, you know, that we have for very long as artists rejected art history and, uh, you know, sort of the modernist tradition and moving past it. And um, that I've been, for some reason, particularly referencing Steve Locke's recent work with the, uh, with the slave block and the reference to Albers and the layers and layers and layers. And even thinking back to the MoMA show of a few years ago of the Forever Now, which had all kinds of problems, but the central thesis was really um, that painting is coming back into a period of growth by referencing art history and by picking up pieces left on the table. So I'm just curious in your role as, a, as an artist, as a curator, um, are you, you know, maybe particularly you can talk about the Giverny piece, but uh, you know, that piece in particular seems to me, it seems like a fairly radical socially activist piece. And you know, what role does something so bucolic like Giverny have in, 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 a, in a work like that? Um, and uh, wonderful to see that disjunction because it raises that question in a very heated way. So uh, I, yeah, so I guess my question is, you know, are, are you seeing this? Sure. Um, so that's the work of Jatavia Gary, who's a Dallas, a Dallas based artist and an experimental filmmaker. Um, and I can't speak for her and I can't speak for her work. Uh, I also, I, I also can't speak for her, um, you know, her own personal experience as a, as a black woman. Um, but what I can tell you is that um, just from my knowledge of the work, um, it is, it is her, her black body in Giverny is meant to create uh, a dichotomy. Uh, it's essentially, it's there to create a, um, um, a point of reference. Um, and, and, I, and, you know, to this question of history, I and mean, I think, you know, um, you know Monet's, uh, you know, when we think about someone like Monet, um, you know, whose, whose work is so central to, to that, um, that time period uh, of that, that, that part of art history. I think what Jatavia is trying to do there is to create a window of opportunity for viewers to examine what the, to examine the role of her, uh, to examine the role of blackness within a European dominated history. So art history is essentially uh, a history of white accomplishments. Um, and then we have um, art of the ancient world, uh, you know, which again is a term that negates all of the contemporary work that's being made in, in um, non-Western countries. Um, you know, uh, the term Latin American art, for example, was created by MoMA. It was actually not created by Latin American artists. It was created by a um, you know, an institution of white curators and white board members to call the thing what they needed to refer to it. So history has been framed by white scholars, by white history, by, by European history for so long that um, it's important that we examine it in that way. It's important that when we talk about art history, that we're referring to a canon that exists, that, that existed before each of us were old enough to know what our history was. And then, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've been in a, you know, like a um, history of Western art two course or sat in on a course where, um, you know, uh, the history of, uh, history of Western art ends with someone like Warhol in the night, you know, in the, in the 1960s, 70s, 80s. And then we don't, we don't get into any of the conversations about, um, you know, uh, contemporary art making. Um, so I think it's important that when we talk about history, we're talking, we, we talk about whose history, uh, we talk about um, who has access to that history, who was the, who's the, who are the authors of that history? And then how can we recontextualize that history? How can we reframe that history? How can we reauthor that, that, that history? Um, you know, I think given the, the residency theme of repatterning and taking a look at, existing structures and how we can build off of them. 
I think, um, you know, I'm also, I'm, I'm, I've been very, very uh, inspired and motivated by the work of Helen Molesworth, you know, for example, who, you know, when she arrived at LA MOCA, she essentially completely represented their uh, collection of modern works uh, sort of, you know, with this framing that, that women, uh, queer men and women were essentially the, um, were central to the American avant-garde. Uh, and it was a, it was a total reframing of, of art history through this collection of MOCA. Um, and I'm, I'm incredibly inspired by, by moves like that, which reframe histories that we thought that we uh, had down pat. Um, so in the, in the case of her work specifically, she's, she is playing with that, um, but she's also using, you know, she's using drone footage. She's using, you know, um, footage of Fred Hampton giving a speech in Chicago. There's images that, you know, of, there's a, a film, uh, uh, excuse me, footage of Josephine Baker and um, this very, very complicated uh, and emotionally intense performance by Nina Simone where, uh, where you know, her, um, she's, in, she's speaking to uh, the audience at this, this performance for a, a largely white audience. Um, I think it, context is so important. Um, and I think as we, you know, take a look at history, it's, it's important that we look at the, the, that we step back and take a look at the, the big picture. Um, but I think with regard specifically to the Giverny suite, you know, Jatavia is really trying to speak to that while also really, really at its core, you know, asking this, this question of black women, do you feel safe in your body? And then through, um, you know, through this film work, through her own experimental film work, she's sort of unpacking all of the aspects that have to do with, with the, the context behind the answer of that question. Yeah, thank you. I, I think we've examined so deeply so many of our own personal histories, this and that, and that, um, that, that piece seems exemplary to this idea of, 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 of bodily occupying art history, you know, and, and um, in a certain way, putting us, ourselves back in there. So thank you. Great, and we have one last question from Rich. Uh, hello, uh, I've been doing some things myself as far as getting artists together, building community through art and putting on shows for uh, charity to help you know, bring exposure opportunity to the artists while still giving back to the community and bringing people together through the arts. And one of the projects I'm working on now is a creative center for the community uh, but it's requiring bringing together artists, organizations, galleries, museums together, you know, under one sort of central goal to create opportunity and make a um, incubator for creatives and artists. And I seem to have an issue getting those organizations to work outside of their walls. I was wondering if you had any sort of experience in that. No. Um, hmm. Um, that's tough because I think it's difficult for museums, well, for many museums to actually think outside of their own walls or to be concerned with what takes place outside of their own walls. Um, there are organizations, um, you know, that are, that are very, very concerned with the communities in which they're immersed. You know, I'm thinking specifically of, uh, Project Row Houses in Houston, um, where the community is at, a, at the core of, uh, of the, of the mission of that organization and how it uh, engages both with the community itself and with the greater you know, Houston area community. Um, do I have any suggestions for how to motivate folks from museums to be active and to think about uh, their participation outside of those museum walls? Um, I mean, in most cases, I think, um, you know, museums would probably, well, I mean, I guess, I guess, depending on the institution, might want to involve um, curators in that conversation or have a curator or some, um, perhaps like a director of education type of figure active in the conversations. I think where museums, I think, begin to get trepidatious is when they consider, when they think about their involvement, again, because, you know, uh, museums are constantly cautious of every move that they make because 
um, you know, uh, in a way, every decision that the institution makes is a is an extension of who that who that institution is and what it represents. Um, um, yeah, I think. Um, well, I guess maybe this is the better answer to the question, which is that museums are also motivated by money. Um, museums are also motivated by patrons, by donors. Um, so. Um, Perhaps the uh, like a you know as a suggestion, um, the more of of the more patrons or the more the more um, I hate to use the language like patrons or donors, um, but um, money is a great motivator. And if museums, I mean, just to be perfectly candid, if you know if museums feel that one of their donors or a few of their patrons might be incredibly excited about a project, that might actually get them to change some of their thinking. And I'm, and I'm speaking specifically about folks, for example, who might be on a board of that museum or who might be on an exhibitions committee at that museum. Um, you know, collecting museums specifically, I think are, are very um, eager to make their patrons and donors happy. They again, have to balance that with all of the expectations of, uh, you know, their exhibition program, the, the mission of the institution, um, but in terms of, you know, motivating folks or trying to get folks from museums to work and be active outside of those institutions, uh, I, I have less, uh, I have less concrete advice there. Um, but I think, yeah, I think if anything, you know, um, you could also consider um, something like, you know, grants, uh, grant funding, um, and just being able to have access to some resources that perhaps, uh, you know, museum might, um, um, you know, uh, might have access to a, a community partner that you want to work with. And so in that sense, uh, a, a museum or staff at the museum can actually be a great facilitator or connector in terms of trying to form connections that you're trying to make yourself. Um, so maybe that's like a, that's another possible way of considering it too. I, I, I just wish I had a better answer. I apologize. No, not at all. That was very helpful. Thank you. Um, thank you, Evan, for um, sharing all this with us. Can we all unmute and give Evan another round of applause? Um, okay, well, if you have any other questions for Evan, I guess you can ask him at another time. Uh, but yeah, I thank you from all of us in the community, and we'll all see you, uh, I guess, at three o'clock for a small group.